Welcome back, friends, to another edition of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are making our way through a study in the Gospel of John, and we've learned so much already. We still have much, much more to learn. And I want to take this time just to introduce our, our panel, the rest of our panel. To my direct left, we have Ms. Jill Morconi. Thank you, Ryan. On Monday, we look at the woman at the well. All right. And then to your left is Ms. Shelley Quinn. And I'm excited to be here. Tuesday's lesson is Sir... Give me this water. All right. And of course, to your left is Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, uh, Ryan. I have Wednesday's lesson, The Revelation of Jesus. All right. And last but not least, we have uh, Pastor John Denzi. Thank you. I have uh, Thursday, The Testimony of the Samaritans. All right. So our theme this week, obviously, in study number five, lesson number five, is the testimony of the Samaritans. And so we're going to be looking at how the gospel not only just affected this woman at the well in Samaria, but how it would go on and make such a powerful impact there throughout. And so I just want to remind you that if you want a copy of our lesson notes, uh, each and every one of us have made notes, uh, and we all take notes differently, but if you want a copy of those notes and you haven't already already signed up for those, just simply go to 3ABN SabbathSchoolPanel.com and there at the very top there will be a little tab that you can click on and there you can fill out your information and it will automatically submit to us and put you in the loop of receiving uh, our study notes. And so you can study along with us and see exactly and follow along with, with us exactly where we're going in our studies. And of course it can help you also if you're a Sabbath school teacher at your church, you'll know, give a little bit of extra stuff there for you uh, to help uh, launch your studies and to help lead and guide your studies. But before we dive headfirst into this very, very exciting study of the gospel going to the Samaritans, I'm going to ask Pastor John Dins if he would have a prayer for us. Sure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for this opportunity to look into mm -hmm. things that encourage us and help us to understand more about you. Mm -hmm. We ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit that we may speak words of life. And Heavenly Father, we pray for your uh, blessing also upon all those that will listen. Mm -hmm. We ask that you will also enlighten them and open their understanding so that they will be drawn to Jesus. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and we pray that all things will bring honor and glory to you. We ask you for these things in the holy and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Our scripture memory text for this week comes from John chapter 4 and verse 42, which says, Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we <laughs> ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Who were the Samaritans? That's what the lesson starts with. The northern kingdom of Israel had been taken captive by the Assyrians in 722 BC. To create political stability, the Assyrians dispersed their captives throughout their empire. Likewise, captives from other nations were brought to, the, to populate the northern kingdom, and these became the Samaritans who practiced their own form of Judaism. Relations, however, were not good between them and the Jews. For instance, the Samaritans worked against the rebuilding of the temple at the return of the Jews from Babylon. The Samaritans, meanwhile, had built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, but the, this temple was destroyed by the Jewish ruler John Hyrcanus. I guess that's how you say it, Hyrcanus, uh, in 128 BC. I did not know that. It's a new, new, new uh, fact for me. At that time, or at the time of Christ, this animosity continued. The Jews avoided Samaria as much as possible. Though commerce may have gone on, uh, other interaction was taboo. The Jews would not borrow from Samaritans or even receive a favor from them. Within this context, John recounts the encounter between Jesus, the woman at the well, and the people of Samaria in the city of Sychar. And, uh, and as we go on here, you'll see that uh, uh, Sunday's lesson is entitled, The Setting of the Encounter. So uh, Sunday's lesson is kind of looking at how did this whole woman at the well experience begin and how did this encounter go on to grow? Obviously, 
throughout Samaria and Jesus becoming a rather well-known and popular figure there, being that he was a Jew with all of this conflict that was going on between the Samaritans and the Jews. And so uh, we're actually going to begin in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. So John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And we're looking at the background issue that led Jesus into Samaria, because obviously, while uh, there obviously might have been some travel, Jews would have tried to avoid this area and these people as much as possible. So for Jesus to travel through here and of course now engage in conversation and, and sharing and communication, it just was unheard of. And it was something that was very much looked down upon in this particular culture. So John chapter four, verses one to four, notice what the Bible says. It says, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Uh, and then the lesson brings out that technically if somebody, a Jew at this time would have wanted to go to Galilee rather than going through Samaria, they would try to avoid it at all costs and try to take the long route around. That's not the route that Jesus took. And of course, the lesson also brings out uh, that the Pharisees discovered that the disciples of Jesus were baptizing more people than did those of John the Baptist. And of course, this situation could have created tension tensions between John's followers and Jesus. We kind of sense that when you go read John chapter 3, verses 25 to 30. Uh, notice the language is used here. John chapter 3, verses 25 to 30. It says, Then there arose a dispute among some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, Said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have seen I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. And here's that famous verse. He must increase and I must decrease. See, there had to be some clarification, but the lesson brings out that it very well could have been that the reason why Jesus uh, chose to go directly through Samaria, Samaria on his way there was because there was some, probably some disputes and some tensions that were rising because of some misunderstanding and not understanding uh, Christ role just yet, uh, Jesus was becoming very popular and he was winning more and more people and baptizing more people than John. And now there might have been some disputes. And so to avoid that, Jesus now enters Samaria. But of course, there was a plan all along and we see how that plan unfolds. And we're going to see it unfolds there at the woman at the well. But we're going to go on to John chapter four and read verses five through nine. And uh, this uh, the lesson brings out and says, how does Jesus use this opportunity to open a dialogue with the woman at the well? So I can, I can imagine that he probably was given some divine insight that there's something over here in Samaria. Go this way, that there's going to be a powerful encounter. And so John chapter four, verses five to nine, the Bible brings out here, it says, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which would have been about 12 p.m. Noon hour time, I guess you could say. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, but Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verse nine, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And, you know, I really, really enjoyed this particular lesson because Jesus is in a time in which obviously we've established there were some very strong tensions between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. And obviously it's brought out very clear here in the text. Even she was taken back by the fact that this guy's talking to me and he's clearly a Jew. And what's happening here? Not only is he a Jew, but he's a man, he's a male Jew speaking to a female woman at this particular time when it was just them at this well. And the lesson even brings out that there definitely was some stuff going on in her life because this was, would not have been a time in which 
which the women would have come traditionally come and gathered water. They would have done it early in the morning or, or, or late in the evening, but she's coming in the middle of the day. Very much a contrast to what we see in, in, uh, in John chapter three with Nicodemus. He came by night to avoid anyone seeing him and Jesus. Well, this woman comes dead smack in the middle of the day uh, to avoid anyone seeing her and, and who knows what was going on there. But now here's this divine encounter between her and Christ. And she recognizes this is, this is not right. You, you, you're speaking to me and you ask me to give you water. And I just, I just wanted to bring this out because the lesson asked this very clearly. And it, and it got me to thinking as I was going through this, this is what the question, the, the, uh, the question that the lesson brings out at the very end. It says, what are some of the taboos in your own culture that could hamper your witness to others? And, and I, I don't know why, but I, my brain got to rolling. I thought, are there, do we allow certain weird taboo things uh, to prevent us from being a witness or from talking or sharing Jesus Christ with others because of things that we allow to stand in the way. And, and I just begin to jot some notes down here. Uh, sometimes we might allow skin color. Mm, that's true. The color of your, have you allowed the color of your skin or differences in color of skin to share Christ or to approach someone uh, with the love of Christ? What about social class? Do we allow sometimes social class to separate us from really being a witness to others? Because, well, that person, uh, we're, we're just, you know, they're blue collar, they're white collar, we're, they're, they're of this class, I'm of a different class. We don't hang out with those type of people. Financial status, kind of similar, uh, uh, similar uh, environment there, similar conversation. Do you allow financial status? Well, uh, that person's really, really wealthy. They're never going to listen to me. Or uh, that person's beneath me because, you know, I'm, I'm high and influential in the community and Perhaps whatever reason you allow your financial status to keep you from being a witness to someone else. Do we allow uh, gender mm. to be a hindrance? Uh, okay, here's a big one, especially one uh, modern in our times. Do you allow sexual orientation or identity mm -hmm. to keep you from witnessing to a person? Well, that person's a, that person identifies as transgender. So I, I, I'm going to stay away from that. I don't think, I don't think that the Lord would want me to associate with someone like that. I mean, we're talking about, again, the same situation that Jesus and the Jews were dealing with in his time with the Samaritans, just because of who they were and where they were located in the history there. Uh, there was some strong hindrances that people allowed. What about culture? Sometimes we don't understand someone else's culture. They're of a different culture. We don't understand it. So we allow it to be a hindrance for our witness. Uh, Ottawa, well, here's a big one, political philosophy or party. Well, they're a Democrat and I'm a Republican or I'm a, I'm a Democrat and they're a Republican. It, it's, it, 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 you allow these type of things to hinder you. Of course, geographical orientation, we see this here. Uh, well, that person's from over there and we don't talk to those people in that particular region. Or I, that person's from that particular neighborhood. We don't go to that neighborhood. Uh, we have to step up to the plate and ask these tough questions. Are we allowing anything to hinder us from sharing Christ? Because that certainly was the issue in the days of Jesus. I just want to be reminded that in Matthew chapter 18 verses 10 to 14 we have a powerful witness here where it shows that Jesus was willing to leave the 99 to go to the one to see the one saved I'm seeing a glimpse of that here as we're about to talk about this woman in the well or woman at the well Jesus left the 99 to go find the one who was in need and the question remains for us as well are we willing to leave the 99 the unpopular to go out and to go among those that perhaps maybe we don't really have a connection with for the purpose of sharing Jesus Jesus Christ. Mm, amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. That's powerful. I'm reminded that so many times we witness to those whom we like or those in our clique or people group, and God calls us to witness to everyone. That's powerful. I'm Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at the woman at the well, and I'm going to give you five keys to witnessing that I see in this section. Some of the verses will be the same as Ryan's and maybe some as Shelley's, but hopefully we'll gain something from everyone's discussion here together today. Before we discuss those five keys to witnessing, I want to talk about two barriers that were between Jesus and the woman. Now, these were barriers that had to be overcome or had to be broken down. Ryan referenced very clearly the barrier between the Jew and the Samaritan. They were bitter enemies. They're not supposed to be talking to each other. So this is, you could say, strike one right away. How is Jesus supposed to overcome that barrier? How is he supposed to talk to this woman who's a Samaritan and she doesn't like him and his people group don't like her? The other barrier I see, and Ryan brought this out as well, is that he's a man and she's a woman. 
If you look at the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, the women of the Old Testament were actually um, given some status and privilege. You can see that. Miriam led the women in worship. Deborah served as a judge, and she was also a wife and a mother. Huldah was a prophetess that the king consulted. In Genesis 21, God told Abraham Shelley to listen to his wife. Abigail was recognized for her ability to navigate political and familial tension. The wise woman of Tekoa was sent to convince David to accept his son Absalom. But by the time we get to the time of Jesus, the status of women in their Jewish culture had disintegrated, you could say. Some biblical scholars say that it was the influence of the Hellenistic culture, the Greeks coming into that culture. Whatever the reason, by the time of Jesus, the religious leaders would actually cross the street to avoid contact with a woman. Devout men would pray in the morning and thank God that they had not been born a woman. Mm. Mere contact with a woman could render a man ceremonially unclean. Women were not allowed to testify in court, which relegated them to the category of the Gentiles, or the minors, the deaf mutes, or the undesirables. Women were illiterate. In fact, the Talmud said, it is foolishness to teach the Torah to your daughters. So you enter this society, and then you see Jesus is about ready to talk to a woman. Jesus is about ready to crash, as it were, all of those cultural barriers. How are you supposed to break down those barriers? That is actually my first key to witnessing. Know how to break down barriers. You're, there's going to be barriers. No matter who you seek to witness to, there's barriers, whether it's social or economic or status, or Ryan brought out all those barriers that we face today. Know how to break them down. We're in John 4, verse 7, when she comes to the well. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Mm. I love this quote from Desire of Ages, page 184. The hatred between Jews and Samaritans prevented the woman from offering a kindness to Jesus. But the Savior was seeking to find the key to this heart. And with the tact born of divine love, he asked, not offered a favor. The offer of a kindness might have been rejected, but trust awakens trust. In this situation, Jesus knew the key to opening up this conversation was to ask for a favor. And so that's what he did. He said, give me a drink. It's important that we understand what those differences are between us and others prior to witnessing. They can be religious or cultural or ethnic, but understand, know how to break down those barriers. And how are we supposed to know that? Only the Lord Jesus. Ask the Holy Spirit for divine wisdom. God knows what the other person needs. God knows the key to their heart. God knows how those barriers can be broken down. So before you witness, just ask God, what is the key in this situation? How can these barriers be broken down? Number two, push beyond the earthly perspective. We're in verse 9, John 4, verse 9. The woman of Samaria said, how is it that you, being a Jew, asks a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And what does Jesus say? He pushes beyond the earthly perspective. Verse 10, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You know, sometimes when we witness, we just stay in the small talk realm I don't know how else to describe it, but we just stay talking about the weather and clothes mm -hmm. and sports and something that's just small talk and regular. And gee, uh, the Samaritan woman is just staying in the regular small talk. Why, why, why are you asking me a drink? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. Jesus is pushing past that earthly perspective. And he's talking about the gift of God. If you knew what's really happening, he's trying to open up her spiritual eyesight, as it were, that this is not talking about a drink of water. We're talking about something much deeper. Number three, don't engage in controversy. Mm. So many times when we seek to witness, we push past the small talk. We try to get involved in something spiritual. And what if they come at you with something? Well, I believe this and that. And then we start to engage in this controversy. Look at what Jesus does. We're in verse 11. 
11. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with. She's still thinking physical, and he's talking about something entirely different. And the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? And then she seeks to engage in controversy. Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and daughters, de uh, livestock, sorry. Do you know who you're dealing with? We're children of Jacob. We are not outcasts or castaways. But Jesus ignores all that. He doesn't even engage in that controversy. And he pushes to the heart of the matter. Number four, offer something better. I believe in the heart of every man and woman who walks this earth is a God-shaped hole, a desire for something different, a desire for something better. Even people who are wealthy, even people who look like they have their whole life together need Jesus. Mm -hmm. Offer something better. Verse 13, he offers living water. Jesus answered and said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. He, that's the physical. That's what she's thinking in. He's trying to push it to the spiritual. Here's something better. But whoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst. But the water I give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. He's saying, I'm offering you salvation. I'm offering you everlasting life. Do you want that? Offer something better. It reminds me of Jeremiah 2. Two, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And what did they do? They hewed for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. So many times we turn to other things instead of Jesus. We hold on to our idols, as it were, broken cisterns, desperately seeking answers. And Jesus is right there. The wanting to offer us this living water. We turn to people instead of Jesus. We turn to books and philosophies instead of the word of God. We turn to works instead of grace. We turn to fear instead of faith. We turn to tradition and human reasoning instead of the word of God. Isaiah 12, verse 3, therefore, with joy, you would draw water from the wells of salvation. Jesus is wanting to offer this living water to this woman. He's wanting to offer something better. It reminds me when Jesus was at the feast, I think this is John chapter 7. And what does he stand there and cry out? If anyone thirsts, mm. come to me mm -hmm. and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus longed to give this woman that living water. And what does she say? Give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Key number five to witnessing, reach the heart. The woman still didn't completely understand. And so Jesus knew the source of really all her pain and why she was at the well in the middle of the day, as Ryan referenced. So Jesus says to her in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. That's the point of her pain right there. She had all these husbands and the man she's living with now wasn't even her husband. She had a life of pain and Jesus reaches that. He awakens this desire for the living water. And then he reaches to that point of pain. This is where your greatest need is. Reach the heart when you witness. Mm, amen. Thank you so much, Jill. As you can see, we have lots and lots left to learn and we've learned so much so far. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back in just a moment. Hello, I'm Greg Morconi. I'm so glad you've joined me for today's 3ABN Mission Moment. Have you ever met someone whose life was changed by YouTube? Travis is from Iowa. His parents taught him the value of hard work, honesty, and respect. He attended Catholic Mass each week, but he never learned to read the Bible for himself. Early on, Travis showed an amazing aptitude for math, but was placed in a class for students with special needs because of a learning disability but the fighting and bullying brought about anxiety and an obsessive compulsive disorder made things worse. His mind was filled with uncontrollable thoughts and he repeated certain behaviors over and over. He felt trapped and alone. 
Despite the fact that reading was hard for him, Travis wanted to go to college. But when his counselor suggested that college was not for him, he gave up and dropped out. After working several jobs, he was hired as a machinist. And despite all his difficulties, he met and married a young lady, moved to a bigger city and bought a home. But all his dreams came crashing down when he got a voicemail from his wife telling him their marriage was over. Can you imagine the loneliness and despair he must have felt? What could he do? Who could he turn to? The only one who might help him was God. And when he prayed, things began to change. Find out how God used 3ABN and YouTube to help Travis next time on 3ABN Mission Moment. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are on lesson number five, the testimony of the Samaritans. And we're going to pass it on to Ms. Shelley Quinn for Tuesday's lesson. Mm, thank you. I am going to be building on Jill's lesson. I am Shelley Quinn. I have Tuesdays. Sir, give me this water. You know, it's interesting. Jesus used illustrations from the natural world to explain spiritual concepts. To Nicodemus, he's saying, you've got to be born again. And of course, he's speaking of the rebirth, new creation in Christ. And to the woman, he says, I'll give you this living water. Well, both Nicodemus and the woman take it wrong. I mean, they, they take his words literally without spiritual comprehension. I want to go back to John chapter 4, verse 10, but let me set this up for just a minute. We cannot judge this poor woman who had had five husbands, five divorces. During their day, a man could say, you burn the toast, I'm through with you, I divorce you. And it was done. I mean, women were really kind of living on the edge, if you would. So here's this woman, five exes. Now she is living in sin. She's living with a man, six men. And when she came to the well, she had no idea. She was about to meet man number seven, the man of perfection. And so he says to her in John 4.10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You know, in my sanctified imagination, if you will allow me for just a moment, I see Jesus spreading his arms out like the posture he would take on the cross, saying to this woman, woman, if only you knew, I am the gift of God. I will give you eternal life. So she says to him, or he says in verse 13, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. You're, you're looking for the water from the well, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst again, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. You've already referred to at the feast where he's talking in John 7 that this living water is the Holy Spirit. Now listen to the woman's response, John 4 verse 15. Sir, Give me this water that I may not thirst nor have to come here to draw. As Ryan pointed out, she's coming in the middle of the day, most likely to avoid the clucking tongues and pointing fingers of other women who are coming to draw. She's ashamed. She's living in this shame. She's ostracized. She didn't want to have to come back out here. She's still thinking literally. But it's interesting. He's asked her for a drink. Now the conversation has shifted. She's asking him for a drink. So now, boy, you talk about a conversation shift. Oh, sir, give me this water. He says to her, go this is verse 16 of John 4. Go call your husband and come here. <laughs> wow. Now that's quite the conversation. Why, why did he approach this topic this way? 
He could read her heart. He knew she is trying to avoid him knowing what's going on, but she's avoiding her past, and he knew that she had to face her situation to be healed. You know, the truth of what uh, Jesus told Nicodemus and the woman at the well is reflected in Ezekiel 36, Mm -hmm. verses 25 through 27. God said, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be cleansed. I will cleanse you. That is covenant language. That's a covenant promise. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will, again, a covenant promise, give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will, a covenant promise, take that heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I will cleanse you. This is spiritual cleansing from sin. We know that 1 John 5, 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin and man cannot make himself righteous again. So what do we do? 1 John 1, 9, We go to the Lord and it says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and not just to forgive you, but to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He puts that new heart. This is the the new covenant. Actually, the word can mean renewed. The renewed covenant is the indwelling Holy Spirit. Remember when King David prayed? in Psalm 51.10. And he is repenting and he cries out to God. It says, create in me a clean heart. Mm. Did you know the word he uses there is bara? It is the same word that is used in Genesis 1, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bara is a word that is only used of God. It means to create something from nothing. Only God can create a new heart in you. Only God can create something out of nothing. Bara in me, a clean heart, O Lord. And what I love about the Lord is that what is his nature? God is Love, Mm -hmm. God is light. That's his righteousness. But he, when he creates in us a new heart, Romans 5, 5 says he pours his love into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, we can't even keep, what are the two most important commandments? Mark 12, 30 and 31, that We would love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we would love another one another as we love ourselves. Mm. I can't do that in my flesh. Mm -hmm. If I loved, I I can't even love the Lord the way He wants me to love Him. Love is a gift. Mm. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So when God pours His indwelling Spirit in me. He creates in me the ability to do what he asks of me. You know, the new covenant, some people think the Ten Commandments have been done away with. No, they haven't. The Ten Commandments are God's boundary of love that show what he deserves as our sovereign creator, his rights. This is the charter of rights for his government of love. And so it shows the rights of God as our covenant creator, and the rights that we owe to one another. But in the new covenant, these are boundaries of love. Listen to this. Actually, Jeremiah 31, 13, uh, 31 through 34 talks about this. And then the author of Hebrews, who we believe is Paul, is he repeats this 
in the New Testament, Hebrews 8, 7 through 13. He says, if that first covenant, and first there is former, if the former covenant, he's referring to the book of the covenant, the book of the law, the civil, the social, and religious ceremonial practices with their feast days and the annual Sabbath. He said, if that had been flawless, then no place would have been sought for a second. But verse 8, Hebrews 8, 8, because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, renew the covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. But he goes on and he says, this is the covenant that I will make with them. I will put my laws in their minds, write them on their hearts. Here he's referring to the Ten Commandment law of love, which is his charter of rights. And this can only be we walk in obedience, motivated by love, by the living water that God pours in us. Amen. Amen. I love that. New Covenant emphasis We are in Wednesday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and I have the lesson called The Revelation of Jesus. And that's what we see here in this encounter with the Samaritan woman. We see the revelation of Jesus. You know, there's a verse in the Bible, Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, and it kind of identifies how it is that we're to approach people as we witness. Uh, Jill shared a number of principles that we can use out of this story. And Jesus engages all of those principles and more. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, let your speech, and that word speech means your conduct, the way you carry yourself. Let your speech, let the the way you carry yourself be always with grace, seasoned with salt. So you got grace as the main entree, and then you got the salt as the seasoning. You don't separate the two. And we see this in Coloss- or excuse me, in John chapter 1, you know, verse 14, we talked about how Jesus Christ was filled with grace and truth, and how many times those get separated in the way that we witness. We're either all about the truth or we're all about grace, but Jesus Christ blended them both together. And we see this in this, in this story. I have verses uh, 16 to 24, but as we move toward those verses, you find a lot of grace. Uh, For example, in verse 4, Jesus must go through Samaria. Why must he go through Samaria? Jews don't go through Samaria. Why does he have to go through Samaria? Because he's the Savior. That's why he has to go through Samaria. He's come to save us, and he's come to save every person, even the Samaritans. You know, the, the woman in the Bible represents a church, and we know in Revelation that there's a fallen woman, a fallen church, and God says, my people are in there, and I must get them out of there, right? He, must, he has a message for every single person, no matter where they are. He has a message for this. So that's grace. That's grace, this message. And then in verse 9, it says, uh, then says the woman uh, of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew ask of me, which am a woman of Samaria, a, a drink. Jews don't have anything to do with, with Samaritans. There's more grace right there. And then as we continue down in verse 10, uh, it says, Jesus said unto her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that, that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. There's more grace. And then in verse 14, uh, whoever drinks of the water that I give will never thirst again. It, it'll be a well of water springing to everlasting life. Grace, 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 grace. And then we get to our verses. Verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus knew that. He knew that before he asked the question. He knew that. But he was trying to reach that sensitive spot, that that pain that was embedded deep within her heart, that that pain that was becoming a root of bitterness that was going to defile everything. He was trying to reach it so he could heal it. And so he speaks to her truth. That's true. That's true. That's what he says. Yet thou hast well said, you have no husband, you have five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that thou saidest truly. Now, I really love the way Christ <laughs> approaches this. You're telling the truth. I agree with you. I agree with you. Let me affirm what you just said. Let me affirm this that you are telling the truth. And of course, she answers and she says, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. (laughs) That's pretty good. (laughs) You you figured it out. He's a prophet, but he's much more than a prophet. And of course, she's going to detour the conversation away from this sensitive area. 
our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. Is that grace or truth? That's truth, right? You don't know what you're worshiping. We can't leave the salt out of the, the grace, right? Colossians 4 verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. We can't leave the salt out. People need salt. People need truth. People need to know the truth about worship, about God. They need to know the truth about where they are and what their situation is. And Jesus is able to share, even with the most hurting people, he's able to share with them the reality. I mean, this woman goes running back to the Samaritan village after this all over. She says, come and meet a man that told me everything I ever did wrong. Isn't this the Messiah? What an amazing revelation That's right. that Christ is giving to us here of how to engage people in a way that would not offend them necessarily, at least people that are in this, this hurt, this pain, but would open them up to be comfortable with declaring their past failures because they have hope, because, because Jesus has directed this woman to hope. You don't know what you're worshiping. The hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. And there's a little play on grace and truth. Spirit, what kind of spirit are you of? Didn't Jesus ask that to his disciples more than once? You don't know what kind of spirit you are of. We can have the truth, but not have the spirit of the truth. And the spirit of the truth is manifested in this encounter with this woman. This is the spirit of the truth. And then he says, the father seeketh such to worship him. Those who worship not just in truth, not just on the right day, uh, not just understanding all the right theology, but also worship him in spirit. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the quarterly goes on to say that the light was too blinding for this woman to look at directly. While recognizing Jesus as a prophet, the woman practices avoidance again. She asked Jesus a question of religious controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans, the proper place of worship. In response, Jesus pointed out that the Samaritans did not know what they worshiped. They worshiped their worship was a synthesis of Judaism and paganism, a mixture. Paganism had come into their religion, and there are many people who are in the same situation today. And I'll just be really frank with you. Sunday worship comes directly from paganism. Ezekiel chapter uh, 8 and 9, it, those chapters identify sun worship as a, of pagan origins. And that's where we get sun worship from today. Even though we can say, oh, it's the day that the disciples gathered, the day they broke bread, the day Christ rose, none of that gives us a biblical basis or a commandment for going to church on Sunday. The Bible teaches the Sabbath is Saturday, the seventh day of the week. So there's a, there's a mixture taking place here. And Jesus Christ goes ahead and identifies that issue in relationship to this woman, not in relationship to the doctrines, but in relationship to her heart need. You have a need to worship God. And let's not talk about the right day or the wrong day right now. Let's talk about the heart issue that you're dealing with, the thing that's deep down inside you, the way that you've been treated or mistreated by all these different people. And we could say, in a sense, that this woman was open to receive. In fact, Christ does something with this woman that he does with nobody else. In verse 26, 25 and 26, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, Jesus said unto her, this is amazing. I that speak unto thee am he. Yeah. He yeah. couldn't say that to, let's just talk uh, among us. He couldn't say that to a Seventh-day Adventist. He couldn't, he couldn't tell his fellow church members who he was, but he could say it to a Samaritan. He could say it to someone who was of another religion. You know, in all four Gospels, the quarterly says, this is the only passage before his trial in which Jesus plainly stated to someone that he was the Messiah. That's amazing. That is amazing. In other words, and you see this even in the birth of Christ, God has to choose people who aren't even of the Jewish faith to declare the coming of his son. And you've got the Magi, mm. the Magi, the wise men searching for Jesus. And he can't share this with the Pharisees. He can't share this with the religious leaders. They're not, they're not prepared for Christ to come as a babe. But the Magi, they're looking, they're searching. And you know, friends, wise men still seek him. 
right? God is available to each one of us. We don't have to have some kind of religious authority or uh, pedigree behind us in order for God to open up to us these beautiful truths of himself in Jesus Christ, Messiah. And you notice he didn't do it to some large crowd or some important personage or to some, un, uh, but, but to an unnamed Samaritan woman, uh, the quarterly goes on to say, who was alone at Jacob's well. He's interested in any lonely soul who feels separated and alone, right? So this woman, was not only an alien uh, of, of culture, uh, but he, she was of the lowest moral character, right? She, she had had five husbands and she was living with a man right now. And yet Jesus openly reveals who he is. And having thus revealed to her his knowledge of her darker secrets, he also gave this woman great reason to believe in him as well. And that's really our mission. We're called Christians because we believe that we're to be like Christ. Mm -hmm. And many times we miss these beautiful insights that the Bible gives us of what Christ was like in relationship to people because we get so caught up in the truth. Now, the truth is important, but of course we have this emphasis from John, uh, this disciple who writes this gospel at the very end of his life that reminds us that doctrine has a place, truth has a place, but the grace of God has to be the substance, has to be the, the main entree of everything we do and how we conduct ourselves so that souls can be one to Jesus. Amen, amen. What a blessing to hear each one of you. Uh, well, my name is John Zinzi, and I have Thursday's portion of the lesson, the testimony of the Samaritans. This takes us to John chapter 4, now beginning in verse 27, and it says, And at this point his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? Remember that Jesus had just told this woman, I that speak to you, I am he. And so now the disciples arrive on the scene, and they're looking at this, mar they're, they're shocked. They're, well, he's talking to a woman. And so they had been, of course, in the same area. They had heard, uh, influenced by the scribes and the Pharisees. They were surprised. And I'm reading to you from something called Win Vincent's Word Studies. Uh, it says this, they were surprised not at his talking with that woman, but that their teacher should converse with any woman in public. The rabbinical writings taught that it was beneath a man's dignity to converse with women. It was one of the six things which a rabbi might not do. Let no one, it is written, converse with a woman in the street, uh, not even with his own wife. It was also held in these writings that a, a woman was incapable of profound religious instruction. And it says, rather burn the sayings of the law than teach them to women. Uh, adding on to what Sister Jill already said, this was the mindset of these people. So is this still true? You know, it's interesting now that uh, among some of the Jews today, there are some women that are rabbis. Uh, but to some degree, this still remains with them. I remember being in, uh, in Jerusalem at one point, uh, the only time I went, by the way. But we were in a small group, and we had the opportunity to talk to a rabbi. And the, the lady that was with us, uh, through a translator, was talking to the rabbi, and she was so grateful for what the rabbi said that she said, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And she put her hand out to shake his hand, and he looked at her and turned away. She was really offended. She did not understand the culture and the reasoning behind this. And of course, Jesus here is doing something to let the disciples know uh, what they are doing is not right. Women have a rightful place, and he was bringing that to their attention. Now, moving to John 4, verse 28. The woman left her water pot <laughs> went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Interesting what she says. You know, at first she seems reluctant to talk about her life, but now she has a, something has happened to her. 
She's began, she has begun to drink of the water of life and it's now flowing from her because she's not afraid anymore. Come and see a man that told me whatever I did. And now it's interesting that she does not say, come and see the Messiah. She says, could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah? So it awakens interest and apparently what she said was of such impact that we have the men coming out to see Jesus. Uh, now, I want to read uh, first before I go on from the Ministry of Healing, uh, page 28. How much interest Christ manifested in this one woman. Her, how earnest and eloquent were his words. When the woman heard them, she left her water pot and went into the city, saying to her friends, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? We read that many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. That's verse 29 and 39. And who can estimate the influence which these words have exerted for the saving of souls in the years that have passed since then? Wherever hearts are open to receive the truth, Christ is ready to instruct them. And that's talking about today. He reveals to them the Father and the service acceptable to him who reads the heart. For such he uses no parables to them. As to the woman at the well, he says, I that speak unto thee am he. This woman was blessed. This woman could not contain herself, even forgot, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to go get water. Left her water pot there and went into the city to share the good news. What a blessing it was. And it's, you know, I, I began to ask myself, what could have been the experience of Jesus going through that Samaritan town if he had talked to one of the men or somebody else? But, you know, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. And this woman needed the Savior in her life. Not only that, Jesus knew that this woman, uh, perhaps unlike any other, would spread the word. And what a message she had to share. Her life was transformed. John 4.30 then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. <laughs> but he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Of course, he's speaking to them spiritually, and the disciples are not catching it. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. This is what brought satisfaction to Jesus. Forgetting even his physical need, Jesus was satisfied doing what he did. John 4, 35, Jesus goes in a different direction. Notice this. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And I say to you, pausing here, this was the case during the, the time of Jesus, the fields were ready for harvest. And today, the fields are ready for harvest or need to be harvested already. Where are the laborers? Where are the laborers? They need to go like this woman into the city and tell the people to come to Jesus. Verse 36, and he who reaps, the same was then, is today, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. There is work that has been done, but much work is needed still to be done. Join Jesus in this labor. Through him, through, through you actually, Jesus still seeks to save that which is lost. Notice verse 37. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. We need to enter into the labors of others. Seeds are being planted all the time. Eve 3 ABN, 24 hours a day, broadcasting the everlasting gospel. Seeds are being planted. We need to harvest through the grace of the Lord. Now I read to you from the lesson. It seems strange that Jesus' narrative about a harvest would interrupt the story of the conversion of many in the city. But John wants us to see how Jesus understood what was happening. Sharing the plan of salvation with a Samaritan woman was far more important to him than was eating. 
to lead souls to salvation was his purpose. And he used this occasion to teach his disciples the urgency of sharing the gospel with all people, even with those not like them. So uh, we need to pick up and catch this urgency and bring the gospel to people. John chapter 4, verse 39, and many mm. of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. <laughs> and so please <laughs> listen to the voice of Jesus. He's asking you to do the same so that many will believe because of what God does through you. Uh, moving to John chapter 4, verse 40. And when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. <laughs> what a wonderful opportunity for Jesus. They urged him to stay. What, what should Jesus do? He said, the Samaritans, the Samaritans, you know. But uh, Jesus stayed there uh, uh, two days and the disciples surely must have been shocked. Mm. But notice verse 41, and many more believed because of his own woman, because of his own word. Uh, what a, a, a great, great thing happened. And so verse 42, I need to move quickly. Then, he, then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, mm -hmm. for we ourselves have heard him mm -hmm. and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. What a testimony. And uh, these, were, these were great words for Jesus to hear because, uh, you know, we read in John chapter 1, uh, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But this was music to the ears of Jesus. Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Denzi. All right, we're going to go back through each panel member, and let's get some final thoughts. Thank you, Ryan. What an incredible lesson. As I'm just reminded that as we witness to others, those people in turn become witnesses for Jesus, and that ripple effect continues. So what a tremendous difference when you witness to just one. Amen. What strikes me about this woman, this Samaritan woman, is that she was the most unlikely evangelist in the mm -hmm. world, but she opened the doors for Jesus to stay two days there. And mm -hmm. you know what? He didn't do any miracles there. Those people believed him mm -hmm. because of the combination of grace and truth. Amen, amen. You know, the woman at the well is you. You are not passed by because of your history. Uh, Messiah is coming to you. Christ is interested in you. And Jesus knows everything you've done wrong, all the mistakes, and yet he wants to give you living water Amen. and take away your thirst for empty relationships so that you will never thirst again Amen. except Jesus Christ and the offer he has for you and your life will never be the same again. Amen. Amen. You know, they say that you can count how many seeds there are in an apple, but you cannot count how many trees and fruits of those trees are in that one seed. Mm. So I encourage you to plant seeds for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This lesson has reminded me of Matthew 18, verses 12 to 14. Mm. Jesus says, what do you think? If a man uh, has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? Verse 13, and if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over the sheep, over that one sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. And so, you know, I just want to be reminded here of this powerful lesson that Jesus gives the perfect example of going in to this other country that most didn't expect to get that last one, that one person that had strayed. Join us next week for lesson number six, more testimonies about Jesus.